following interview was conducted with James J. Boris, Professor Emeritus of Agronomy for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Friday, December 3rd, 2010 in Stewart Center, 263. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Good afternoon, Professor Forrest. Thank, Thank you, you so you. much. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents in early years. Okay, I was born uh, literally on uh, a farm in Putnam County, Ohio, uh, near the town of Kaleida. It's actually the farm that uh, has been in the family name for 130 or 40 years, and we have on our dining room wall the uh, land deed for part of the land that was signed by President Polk's Secretary of Agriculture in Longhand. And uh, I've uh, now own that farm. I uh, bought my brothers and sisters out about 10 years ago, and so I now own that farm. Uh, I was the oldest boy. I have one older sister. There were <coughs> uh, five in our family. Uh, my mother died when I was 10 years old, and uh, dad remarried, and uh, so I have uh, actually a half brother and half sister. And but the way the family is, you never know it. Actually, I'm probably closer to my brother than to any of the others. Sure. Um, and so uh, after uh, or I grew up, went to uh, the high school and grade school and high school there. The uh, grade school I went through eighth grade was taught by uh, Catholic nuns, Sisters of Divine Providence, even though it was a public school. And uh, then I went to high school to the little local high school. There were 38 in my high school graduating class, and that was the largest class that the uh, school had ever graduated to that date. So, well, well, were any students, did they have any clubs or activities and things or any athletics that they had as a high school that you participated in? Yes, in, in high school, uh, I was always involved in agriculture. I helped my dad on the farm uh, throughout my whole high school career. I actually started earlier than that, started in grade school. And... Um, I was involved primarily in the FFA program. I was uh, the president of our chapter for a couple of years. Uh, as far as other things, I pray, played uh, intramural sports and things of that nature. But uh, I was also a member of the uh, National Honor Society. I uh, held a class office uh, or two during my junior and senior year. Uh, uh, my primary interest, though, was always with uh, everything with agriculture. I used to spend, at that time, in the springtime, uh, I would uh, take off from school so I could help with the planting. And in the fall, again at harvest time, why I'd be allowed to stay home from school and help with the harvest. As a matter of fact, one time the superintendent told my dad that uh, he's got to come to school some days. You can't leave him at home all the time. So, but that was uh, primarily my high school activities. Okay. Then how did you happen to choose to go to Ohio State, which is well, next? That was an interesting situation also. Uh, I was combining beans. Uh, one fall, beautiful fall day, 1960. I had, by the way, uh, applied at Ohio State. I guess uh, one of my high school counselors almost forced me to apply, and I did. And um, uh, the we had an emergency light at home that went on. Usually, it meant it's time to come home to to eat. That light went on, and gosh, it was beautiful combining weather. I couldn't. I thought somebody, you know, somebody got hurt or something. I pulled the combine on the yard, and Dad says, you got to go to college tomorrow. I says, I can't. I says, we have all these beans. The weather's perfect. And my dad told me that uh, the beans will always be there. He says, you have to go to college. I don't care if you finish. He says, you have to go to try it so that you know when you're my age you haven't made a mistake by not going. So I went to Ohio State, majored in, obviously, <laughs> agriculture, and um, for three years, I one quartered it more. I will go. I'm going to go one quarter more quarter, and I'm quitting and going home and farm. So I did that for three years, and uh, my fourth year, uh, my senior year, um, I uh, met this little Italian girl, and so I decided I'd better finish up because that was pretty nice being down in Columbus then. But throughout my whole college career, uh, I majored in agricultural engineering because I loved equipment, loved working on equipment. But I always worked in the agronomy department, worked on the farm, uh, the research farm. And the reason I did that is because that got me outside. I just loved the spring planting time and the uh, fall harvest time. In the summers, I would obviously come home and uh, work the farm. But um, so I went through that through my entire uh, undergraduate career. 
Uh, I also joined an agricultural fraternity and actually worked my way up to president of that. And uh, I gather you lived on campus and in the fraternity house too. I did my yeah. my junior and my senior year. Sure. Yes. Prior right. to that, we lived in apartments uh, with another another boy from back home. Yeah. Um, that was uh, that got me through my undergraduate career. <laughs> Sounds good. And then did you get married while you were there? Well, what happened was uh, as I was uh, working in the agronomy department, uh, the one of the professors came up to me my senior year and uh, asked me if uh, I would be willing, if I wanted to uh, go to graduate school and if I wanted to be a teaching assistant. Well, farm prices were terrible at that time. Here I was, the oldest boy in the family with uh, younger siblings that were, uh, you know, to go through. There wasn't really room for me on the farm at home at that time. So I thought, gosh sakes, they're going to pay me. I get to go to college, and uh, I get to be near my girlfriend. So I uh, says, okay, I'll do that. So I actually majored in turf science and turf management for my master's degree. Um, went uh, for two years that finished that up um, and in the process of uh, doing that uh, I graduated with my master's in uh, the fall of 66 with my BS in the spring of 64 and in the summer of 66 uh, we got married I was also those summers then I was working for OM Scott and Sons at Marysville Ohio as a turf grass uh, research agronomist and uh, really enjoyed that tremendously wonderful experience. But uh, as I was finishing my master's degree, I thought, now I'm going to go home and farm. Well, uh, my major professor, again, applied for me to a position at the University of Nebraska that a colleague of his had told was open. It was uh, an instructorship position at uh, the University of Nebraska teaching agronomy. And I thoroughly enjoyed my teaching, really loved it. And uh, so here he applied for me. He says, hey, you've got to answer this call to Nebraska, and it's really a good opportunity. So uh, right, uh, we got married, uh, and my bride and I hopped in the car and went to Nebraska to see what we were getting into and uh, to get her a job. And so we moved to Nebraska then uh, as soon as I, uh, immediately after I got my uh, uh, master's degree at Ohio State, the following week we moved to Nebraska and uh, I started on a PhD there in crop physiology. And you got your PhD from in Nebraska? From the University of Nebraska. During okay. that time I was on the teaching instructorship. Uh, my major professor and I developed the very first for the university, the first uh, audio tutorial uh, self uh, uh, learning teaching system at the whole university. And uh, That's so, really in the early days of that. Yes that was. That was in 1968 we did that and wow. it was a tremendously good experience. Right. And then it was, did you do something before you came to Purdue? I actually, again. Because uh, you came in 69, right? I came in fall of 69. I graduated, got my uh, uh, PhD in the summer of 69, and I came to Purdue in the fall of 69. And here uh -huh. again, my major professor at, at Nebraska applied for the job for, for me here. And I thought, oh my golly, what'd you do that for? He told me, he says, you have to call Dr. Peterson, the department head, who was a friend of his, uh, who had apparently called my major professor and wanted to know if there's anybody at Nebraska who uh, could fill a teaching position here. And so he says, yeah, I would do that. So I thought, oh my golly, I'll, uh, it was an honor just to, I, I filled out the application, I thought they aren't gonna call me. And uh, when they called me for an interview, I thought that was an honor just to be called for an interview. And uh, so then when I got the job, why, well, yeah, Obviously, I took it. I can remember Dr. Peterson calling me, and he says, uh, you know, we would like to offer you the job, and I says, I'll take it. And he says, well, you may want to talk this over with your wife first, he said. <laughs> so, <laughs> so at any rate, I started out at uh, my beginning pay in, uh, in 1969. I, it was 12700 a year. And uh, actually, when I got here, he says, "Well, we were able to. Uh, we'll, able, we'll start you out at thirteen thousand. I thought, "Boy, what am I going to do with all the money?" So, Where'd you live when you first came here? Uh, when we first got here, we moved into some little apartments out on Pemberley Courts on Klondike Road. We lived oh. there for a year, and uh, then we bought a house on South River Road, and we lived there for um, four years. And during that whole time, while we were that was uh, near the, uh, the, uh, what's your, uh, the port. 
far, not too far from the not fort. Not too far from the fort, right across right. from the, the McCall's restaurant, actually, right. almost right across. Yeah, I know, I remember yeah. the house that you had. And so, th but during that whole time, I kept looking for uh, farmland. I had to, just had to be out of town. And so uh, in 72, I was able to purchase uh, 30 acres out west by Montmorency, a mile west of Montmorency. And uh, at that time, I didn't know how in the world we would ever pay for it, but we thought we'll pay for it anyways. So uh, I then went on sabbatic in 1975, 76, and when I uh, came back, we uh, built a house out there, and that's where we live now. Uh, you, there wasn't a house on the property? It was, oh. it was. Uh, you just bought the property for Yes, the farm. we bought the property. It was uh, primarily woodland and scrub land. It hadn't been taken care of. And uh, so we've since kind of taken care of it. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Tell us a little about um, and teaching. Making education relevant has been a cornerstone of your philosophy, right? Teaching. Tell us about that. And you were the coordinator for the undergrad teaching program. Yeah, uh, when I came to Purdue, uh, my job was to, I was hired to be the primarily, my major responsibilities were to teach introductory agronomy. Well, I became involved with the undergraduate clubs right away. I advised the uh, uh, undergraduate agronomy club, and then for several years, I co-advised the uh, Ag Council and mm -hmm. the, for the School of Agriculture, and uh, thoroughly enjoyed all of those interactions with uh, these yeah. students. Uh, in addition to that, other courses that I've taught, uh, when uh, one of my colleagues uh, had a heart attack, I took over the grain crops course and taught that for about four years. And uh, then the curriculum was revamped and the course was changed. Uh, I also initiated a course in crop adaptation and distribution and taught that for a couple of years. And, uh, but I've always taught for my entire career, I've uh, taught introductory agronomy uh, every semester except when I was on sabbatic or wasn't here. And uh, I also, in 1993, I think, uh, I started a course uh, in association with a professor from English uh, entitled Contemporary Issues in Agriculture. And uh, this course was uh, primarily looked at ethical issues of uh, how we produce our food and fiber. Another course that uh, I, I Two other areas that I thoroughly enjoyed uh, was I used to teach the short course. I taught the crop production course part of the short course. And uh, that's the only time whenever, when that course is over one year, that I got a standing ovation after the class. And uh, that was very humbling yeah. for me. Is those, are those, um, Pierre, are those the winter courses? That those were the winter have? courses, I've yeah. asked several people, because uh, I remember them very well having been here, but yeah. they're no longer. No, they aren't offered anymore. What, what ever happened to that program? Um, for some reason, uh, it, it was been decided, going for, excuse me, for quite a period of time. It, it had been going before I got here. Okay. And uh, then uh, I guess I'm not sure why it was oh. disbanded, but they were. Yeah, well, it's been gone so. for some period of time. Although sometimes, don't they, for the ag, uh, the, um, ag alumni thing, the, um, they sometimes have, have had some courses before him, but maybe they're not doing that anymore. I don't know, mm, but the I program know. has you know changed a lot. Yeah, it's it's moved a lot. Right. One other course that I taught for two years, uh, that a former gra or a graduate student of mine and I taught was just entitled "Experiences in Agriculture." We did this in the uh, early '80s, and the reason for that was we were getting more and more students who did not know the practical aspects of crop food production. So this was a one-hour course where we took students out to the agronomy farm. We let them sit in a tractor. We explained to them all of the various uh, mechanisms of producing food and fiber, what the equipment was, how they did it. We took them on a field trip to see how seed corn was processed. And that, again, was a tremendously rewarding uh, experience. Uh, uh, it was a, uh, one of the most rewarding experiences I did. Yeah, that, let's talk about, um, that. Did, and you did mention about the crop production course. You sort of. Um, got that going. Is that mm -hmm. one of the ones that you were also? Yeah, I initiated in that. Right. Uh, we moved the, changed the laboratories around, and uh, I initiated some uh, independent learning. We st I started the uh, Crops Resource Center, got an innovative teaching grant to do that in 1974, I think, and uh, 73, and uh, developed that. We uh, made it so it was somewhat of an open lab, although we still taught our normal labs.
All right. Okay. Let's talk about some of the things. The, the um, Certified Crop Advisor. Program. That program started uh, in 1993, uh -huh. and uh, at that time there was an effort to try to uh, certify the competencies of individuals who are pri providing information to farmers. I had un been developing uh, a program that was competency-based and uh, for extension, and this was actually supposed to have been for the Farm Bureau. Uh, the goal of that was to try to uh, identify the knowledges and skills that these individuals needed and then develop an educational program that addressed those knowledges and skills. Well, the uh, Certified Crop Advisor Program found out I was doing this, asked me if I would work with them, and so I started working with them. And up until last year, uh, I have been developing the uh, minimum, minimum competency exams for the program and I also update and uh, revise all of the uh, modules and competencies as to what is needed and expected to be known. And this consists of gathering information from uh, producers and certified crop advisors from uh, Canada and the U.S. The other aspect of that that's important is uh, three years ago, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation provided funding to improve the skills and competency of farmers in the uh, middle in the Far East and they uh, selected India as their country to start this in and so I was asked if I would develop a certified crop program advisors program for uh, India and uh, that is underway we've uh, given the beta exam first time and uh, the first actual exam will be given in December of 2010 and uh, so that is going to be a continuing effort. That sounds very good. So yeah, and then the um, that uh, Natural Resources Conservation Service. Can you talk about uh, that? In pro the yeah. NRCS the Natural Resources Conservation Service approached uh, me about oh gosh uh, several years ago after uh, they had heard about the Certified Crop Advisor Program and its success, and wanted to know if I would help them develop. Uh, uh, a series of learning modules and things of that nature that address uh, the competencies that their technical service providers needed. So in association with a former graduate student of mine, uh, we formed our uh, limited liability corporation and he and I said uh, yes we would do that. So we developed uh, four of their modules and uh, completed them and gave that to them and uh, but then I think uh, change in politics cost cut their funding and so we haven't uh, done any more, although I did receive a call about uh, a month ago asking if uh, we were interested in possibly pursuing this again. Oh, okay. You mentioned just a few moments ago that Crop Resource Center, but for researchers, tell, could you talk about that? Yeah, the Crop Resource Center was, uh, it, the idea there was to try to provide a, a learning center where students could uh, congregate and learn on their own. and. Uh, some of the things that were important in there, and this was used, by the way, by several courses. I opened it up to any course in crop science that wanted to use it. And uh, the turf course used it. Uh, we used it, and the grain crops course used it uh, somewhat, as well as the crops judging courses. But the, the goal here was where students would have a place to congregate, and uh, they could work on uh, class assignments together. Uh, we had live plants in there continuously for uh, identification. And uh, in doing uh, the reading and the uh, uh, trying to keep myself updated on educational methodology, uh, it became very obvious that students learn a whole lot more from each other than they ever do from instructors. And so I wanted to provide a facility where they could do that. Okay. And it worked very well. Uh, there were students in there. We, uh, I, it was always, uh, there was always an instructor in there. I hired undergraduates to help tutor in there. Um, we had displays of previous week's materials, next week's materials that students could come in and study on their own. If for some reason a student had to miss a class, they could come in there and uh, they could uh, visualize the materials that were uh, presented that week. Uh, so it was, uh, it, it's, and is it's it still in operation. Is it, yes. Okay. My is it in, in uh, Lily? Is that yes. In one of the, okay. the uh, lady who replaced me as teaching introductory agronomy is uh, using it extensively. Okay. Very good. You were talking earlier about auto tutorials. Reminds me of Sam Postlewaite. Sam's a very good friend of mine. Yes, he and I discuss things 
a lot. A lot of people don't have forgotten about that, and, and I did. I have interviewed him, and uh, I, rem I remember knowing something about it. You know. Sure. Yeah, it's one of the early early things. Anyway. Really pioneering education. Yes. That's right. International and global. Um, let's talk about uh, the Jordan the University Science and Technology, and then talk about that um, visiting professorship. I think in Bonn, West Germany. Oh, there were, uh, there you picked also the ones that had you another... Uh, You've got quite a few there. <laughs> yeah. I, only, I didn't put, list all of them. Well, the, uh, the first one was in 1976 when I was, uh, had a chance to work with the president of the International Turfgrass Society in, uh, in, at the University of Bonn, Germany, and uh, that was a very uh, worthwhile experience. Uh, and then uh, in, uh, later on in the uh, 1990s, after my sons were in college and out of college, uh, I took another sabbatic, or I was invited by the Jordan University of Science and Technology, which is the second largest university in Georgia, Georgia in uh, Jordan, and uh, to do an uh, evaluation of their agricultural curriculum. So I did that. Uh, I evaluated uh, the courses that were there, the instruction, and wrote a report as to what I found and how I felt their instruction could be. Uh, what the weaknesses were and what the strengths were. Uh, in association with that, so we lived in Jordan. Uh, my wife actually came over and joined me for some time. And what was I, it like? What was your experience? Uh, it was one of the most wonderful experiences I've ever had. Uh, the people, the Jordanian people were uh, wonderful. They, the, I, I can't tell you how much I enjoyed it and the people I really enjoyed were the students. Uh, they would come and sit in my office for hours, and we would just talk. Lots of interaction, I guess. Yeah, right? and uh, of course they were—they kept apologizing for their English, and actually their English was really pretty good. And uh, it made me feel uh, kind of illiterate because they had to talk to me in my language when I was in their country. And uh, the language been, of instruction, I yeah. gather, was in English. I'm sorry. Yeah, yes. Okay. Uh, it was in English and in Arabic. And uh, so uh, most of, yeah, their, their instruction was mostly in English. But uh, that's one thing that I always try to encourage students to do is to try to learn a foreign language. I don't care what it is because uh, sometime or another uh, it's going to broaden their horizons so much. So that was an interesting experience. And then I got back from that and immediately, two weeks later, I had been invited to Oregon State University to work in, uh, to teach uh, uh, an ethics, agricultural ethics course, and to consult on agricultural ethics with the faculty at Oregon State, and uh, this was through their Department of Philosophy. I'm probably the only agronomist who has ever had an appointment in a Department of Philosophy. And so uh, that was a wonderful experience. Again, I taught a course there, and I, was, uh, I added up the number of meetings or conferences that I had, or talks that I gave, and I averaged one a day, uh, seven a week, uh, for the time I was there. Uh, I, I can't tell you again what a wonderful experience that was. And the students there were, uh, again, just wonderful. So just as good as our Purdue students. Good. <laughs> <laughs> um, how about that? Um, the Lars, that Lars is interesting. That participating faculties, that joint Master of Science that you have with Earth Observation, Lewin, and Purdue. Remember that one, um, the Lars? Oh, that was um, yeah. uh, that. Uh, was Trish Johansson involved in that? Or? Yeah, that was what I did. Uh, that wasn't really uh, much of a what. I, what they did was they funded one of my PhD students. Where okay. what we did was uh, uh, try to determine the amount of uh, crop damage that occurs due to environmental effects, and primarily hail. And we wanted to do this remotely so that uh, uh, crop hail adjusters could accurately determine the extent of damage when a hailstorm goes through and uh, how wide or how widespread the damage was. So uh, uh, they, that was uh, what that consisted Is that, that still going? Of. No, oh. that was a, it was a PhD uh, study. Special. And, uh, yeah, we reported on it and uh, we were actually invited to report our results at the conference in England on that. Did you go to, to to the university at the same? Did you visit the university, Lewin, the one in Belgium? No. Oh, you no, didn't. Okay. No, okay. No. Okay. Um, sustainable. Oh, tell about your travel courses. Oh yes, I worked with uh, uh, Dr. Bill Cheney in forestry and his wife Joanne, who was in uh, the uh, liberal arts department here, and uh, we 
thought that uh, again, my idea, my my overarching idea, philosophy has always been to try to broaden our students' knowledge, and uh, my philosophy was that of all of the agronomy that I know, uh, I can pick that out of books. I have never ever had trouble not knowing or being able to answer an agronomic problem. There are some things I don't know, but I can find it very quickly. The problem has usually been in the soft sciences, in the social types of things, how you conduct meetings, how you interact with other people, and uh, uh, those types of things, uh, and especially in other cultures. So I've always told my students that I felt every student ought to have the privilege of being the minority in another country at some time or another so they know how students, when they come over here, feel. Well, uh, so we got together and decided that what we really need to do is take our students on uh, summer study courses whereby we look at agriculture and the arts together and kind of interrelate the two. And so we did this. We traveled, uh, we, we went to South America, uh, we went through Spain, uh, we went through uh, Northern Europe with it, and, and England with the, t with the uh, course at various times. And uh, the art instructor, would uh, Joanne, would take us through the museums, and uh, she picked out certain paintings, and she would uh, explain the artistic value of them, and we would try to get pastoral scenes and things of that nature occasionally, and then I would explain to them the history of what was happening in these scenes uh, because the artists were painting what they were seeing in the 16, 1500s. And uh, I can remember some, we had some students from Indiana University with us on one trip. And uh, we were looking at this, uh, they were looking at this pastoral scene. And uh, I explained to them the agriculture that the artist was depicting. And these two little girls said, I never knew that. Well, see, those are the experiences that we wanted. Right. And uh, they were very good. Yeah, perfect. And are, do they don't have the courses anymore? No, when uh, Bill retired why, uh, and Joanne retired, why they... We, they took the courses they with didn't, them, right? Yeah, there was... <laughs> and, oh. and they were expensive and very... They took a what lot of our time. Did you, uh, what was normally the size of the group? Did you we would them? take about uh, uh, roughly 20 to 25 students. For how long? A couple weeks? Or uh, no, yeah, we would be gone maybe 10 days or so. About okay. 10 days. Okay. I'd like to have that at the end. Sustainable yeah. Agriculture and the International Center for Sustainable Agriculture. Um, well, I became involved with uh, the uh, Sustainable Agriculture Movement back in the 1980s and was part of uh, the uh, movement, the uh, USDA movement there. I was on the committee to select projects to uh, fund for that for a while. Uh, but then um, uh, that I, I always was interested in that. Uh, in uh, Later in the 1990s, um, I became involved with a professor from Iowa State, actually a former graduate student of mine, and uh, the director of, the, Interna of uh, the International Center for Sustainable Agriculture in Panama, Panama. And we met here at Purdue, and well, actually, he was not the director then. He was just working down there. And we decided, we met here at Purdue for oh gosh, a week, and we wrote a grant that got funded to establish the International Center for Sustainable Agriculture uh, in Panama, and it's housed in Panama City, Panama, at the what's called the City of Knowledge there. So the three of us wrote that grant and uh, got it started. I served on the board of directors for that for the first uh, three, three years, six years, I guess. And uh, that program now funds various projects worldwide to uh, try to improve the sustainability of agricultural production. And the major reason why it's in Panama is because this is where the city of knowledge is, uh, the, where it's housed in the old uh, former U.S. Uh, Navy uh, facilities by the canal. And uh, it's also an area that is, has tremendous biological and ecological uh, areas of study, and it's just a natural laboratory. So, uh, Where does that, the funding come for this? Uh, the funding uh, for this came from uh, various world sources. It uh, uh, came; some of it came from U.S. sources. Some of it came; a lot of it came from grants, from uh, oh, such things as the Rockefeller Foundation, places like mm -hmm. that. 
and uh, you've always been involved in the international agriculture so yes the Rockefeller yeah yeah and uh, the World Bank I think right. funded it uh, so it received funding uh, the Spanish government provided uh, some funding for it so uh, Is Panama supported at all oh yes oh. Uh, yes the canal uh, authority supported it because it had a tremendous effect on uh, the canal livelihood right, exactly. so there were there were multiple sources of funding there yeah. Do you know, you were involved in that professor in the classroom. Is that still going on? Uh, uh, as far, I don't know. I, I guess since I retired, I haven't... Uh, you don't hear very much about that. Uh, so I, I, don't, I, I don't know. I don't I know if it is or not. I remember hearing about it, but, you know, I don't, not re recently. That's uh, what I yeah. thought I would ask. Uh, uh, and faculty fellow at Meredith. Um, is he still doing that? No. Uh, when, I, uh, when, when, we, when I started uh, my heavy international traveling in the Middle East, I... Uh, uh, had to kind of give that up is more than I could handle. But th that, again, was a wonderful experience. Right. I used to bring my kids over there, and uh, that was great. Do we would well, it's, cha it's changed a lot now because they have the uh, centralized, you know, the, sure. the, the food centers and things, and you sort of miss, because I was at Tarkington for a period of time after Meredith, and you miss, it was just difficult to get together with the students because the eating facility was not there. It was easier when it was in the same building. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah we used to have the girls come out to our house for... Uh, at least once a semester. That was great. Enjoyed yeah, we really enjoy, I enjoyed it too. Family, talk a little about your family. Uh, I have three sons that, uh, um, uh, how to turn this down. Um, Did they go to Purdue? I, ha I have uh, three sons. The uh, All three of them graduated in agriculture from Purdue. Okay. And my oldest son, Jeff, uh, works for a division, a subsidiary of Dean Foods. Uh, he's in charge of convenience stores. He's one of two national managers for them. And uh, he lives uh, near DeMott, Indiana. Uh, he, has, uh, I've, he has two uh, children, a, a grandson and a granddaughter there. And uh, then my second son, Brian, uh, lives on the farm just around the corner from me. And he and I farm together. Uh, we farm about 500 acres between the two of us. And uh, uh, he and his wife, uh, along with another man, own uh, Proaxis, uh, which is located on 9th Street Road, right aside of the trails. That big factory there is their factory. And uh, they have two other companies in there that, uh, that they run. That it's primarily steel fabrication, and uh, they make uh, agricultural equipment. And uh, they have three daughters, uh, and uh, the oldest one is 10, the youngest one is 4. And then I have uh, my youngest son, Keith, uh, lives in San Luis Obispo, California, graduated from food science here at Purdue, and uh, ended up with a PhD in food uh, microbiology and packaging. And uh, he's now at San Luis Obispo, Cal, Cal Poly at San Luis Obispo, California. And he has three children, uh, a little boy six, a little boy just turned four, and uh, a nine-month-old baby girl oh. that's just crawling. <laughs> Sounds good. A uh, lot of your awards and honors. We'll talk about a few of them. Uh, certainly the Charles P. Murphy Outstanding is, yes. was a nice one. And then an Outstanding Teacher in Agriculture. And you're in the Book of Great Teachers. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, and I've got, uh, oh golly, uh, you got selected the Resident Education Award for the American Society of Agronomy. I'm a fellow in the Crop Science Society of America and the Soil Science Society of America and the National Association of Teacher Colleges and Teachers of Agriculture. I'm a fellow there. Oh, golly. Uh, another thing that uh, has uh, uh, just come my way is um, the uh, Ag Alumni Certificate of, of Distinction. i will be awarded that as the 2000, in 2010. The one coming up, the Lethe in February? February, yeah. Very nice. Congratulations. Yeah, thank That's you. nice. What, um, how have some of these awards, do you know a little bit in advance, and I often ask people that, sometimes they know and sometimes they don't. Well, uh, on it the, varies. yeah, on these other, on the awards, usually there's a write-up that goes with it, and yeah. uh, uh, there's always a colleague uh, that writes them up, and they all contact me, hey, can you help me, what, what do I need to put in the award, you know, this is what you need, <laughs> and that's the way it, I've written up awards for colleagues of mine, <laughs> and uh, so that's the way it goes. <laughs> And, in most uh, cases, right? Yeah. <laughs> the uh, certificate of distinction. I didn't. Uh, uh, one of my one of the agronomy 
uh, professors uh, called me and he had it already written up and uh, he just wanted to check some things and make sure he had them right. And uh, I didn't even know about that. That's very nice. Yeah. That'll be good. Okay. So, uh, and you're a fellow also in the American Society of Agronomy and right. the Crop Science. Mm -hmm. Those are those are very nice. Mm -hmm. How about the Purdue tradition? You have one? Oh, um, the, uh, I guess one of the things that uh, uh, as far as Purdue is concerned, I've always, I just loved my department. Uh, the agronomy department was uh, uh, so great. I have done departmental reviews, USDA reviews at other departments around the country, uh, talked to colleagues at national meetings at other universities, and it always makes me so happy to uh, come back to Purdue. And so one of the things that was kind of a tradition that we started way back gosh sakes, way early was uh, <laughs> Christmas time, this time of the year, uh, or at the last teachers meeting, agronomy teachers meeting, our agronomy teachers get together weekly and meet. And uh, the very last meeting was at Bruno's. And obviously we did no teaching there. <laughs> but uh, we would eat beer, or we would eat pizza and drink beer. And that was something that I just, just loved uh, to do. That was a real faculty get together. We really it's a nice tradition, that. right? And a yeah. nice thing for the faculty to do. Yeah, it was. And we, we it was just really enjoyable. Just really nice. We'd get together and we let our hair down and everybody just had a ball. Way to wrap up the year. Right? Yeah, it was. Right. Okay. Outstanding event? Well you can have more than one. Some of people say, Do I maybe one? I said no. <laughs> There are, if I think back over over the, the thing that probably is the most important thing in my life and the most outstanding event was uh, when I got married. And there's a little bit of a story there. The uh, As I said, my wife was Italian. I was a member of a fraternity. And back at Ohio State, back then, uh, there were all these queen contests and things of that nature. And the uh, 10 finalists for each of these contests would go around to the fraternity houses and put on little skits with their lines. Well, uh, there was a uh, spring formal coming up, and uh, one of my fraternity brothers and I didn't have dates yet. And so we thought, gosh sakes, here's a chance to see if we can get a date. So uh, he and I said, we're going to look over these girls as soon as they're, you know, the skit is over, and we're going to meet in the kitchen and we're going to compare notes. And uh, it's, this sounds kind of uh, funny, but he and I were also taking a livestock judging class at the time. So we thought, well, we're going to do it like that. We're going to pick out the points that we want, you know. Uh, how poised is the girl? How friendly? You know, all of these things. We had, we had points. And uh, so we did that. <laughs> And uh, points this, with the criteria, right? Yeah, the points <laughs> were the criteria that were graded. Yes, <laughs> sounds kind of crude, but that's what we did. That's right. Uh, anyways, uh, so um, after it was all over, why uh, uh, I went down through my notes, and uh, there was this one little girl, a little Italian girl. I thought, gosh, you know, and I knew one of her sorority sisters. So I says, hey, is uh, is she going with anybody? And uh, she said, well, she's kind of got some boyfriend back home, but she's really, no, she's really not going with anybody. She says, can you fix me up? And she says, well, I'll see you once. So uh, first date. And she says, yeah, she'd you know, be an afternoon Coke date. Oh, boy. So I borrowed a buddy's convertible, and I thought, well, right away we've got to find out if this girl's going to be interested in my lifestyle or not. So our first Friday afternoon Coke date, we went out to the Ohio farm science review and we looked at the farm equipment, looked at tillage, walked around that field for a couple of hours, came back, had a coke, I dropped her off and uh, uh, she seemed like she had a good time and I said, well, you know, how about, uh, the, you want to go to church with me on Sunday? Well, yeah. And so uh, I picked her up for church on that Sunday morning and gosh, that went really well. And, uh, go out again and she said, well, okay. So she's been going out with me ever since. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Retirement activities. Well, uh, my son and I, like I said, mm -hmm. are farming I do because he's already what got What do you a, have on your farm, Jim? We raise primarily corn and soybeans, and we have about 20 acres of uh, uh, the forages that we usually sell to horse people or whatever. Uh, that takes a lot of my time because I do most of the equipment maintenance because Brian's already more than 100% employed with two jobs. Um, 
I also work with the Certified Crop Advisor Program, uh, helping them develop their the international programs. Uh, I'm on a USDA grant with my son in California, uh, looking at uh, food quality. Uh, actually, what we're looking at is uh, spoilage and leafy greens as they travel across the country, you know, the problems that they had in the spinach, things of that nature. So uh, I'm part of a multi-university grant. My partner and I are working with that. Um, and that, and uh, of course, obviously, the uh, grandchildren are uh, primary of primary importance to me. <laughs> right. Did you so, go on half time? Uh, have you been? On yeah, half I was on okay. a five year half time program for a while, and the reason I did that is because I could see these other things coming up, and they were just taking too much of my time. And uh, it's kind of interesting, Katie. You know, when you graduated from high school, you were ready to go to college. It was a new phase of your life. When you finally graduate from college, there's another new phase. You, it was a great college education experience, but you're ready for a new phase in your life. Well, I graduated from work at the university from all my teaching. It was the greatest, most wonderful experience. Uh, I couldn't have asked for a better place to work or a better job, but I graduated. And so now I'm uh, doing this, still doing all of the uh, creative things that I did. Uh, but uh, the only thing, and I'm still teaching class. I gave a guest lecture yesterday. Uh, I give a, gave a guest lecture two weeks ago at Iowa State, uh, so I'm still teaching, but it's uh, it's different. It's just, it's just... It's a different perspective and a little bit different arena. I don't have to right. assign grades. The worst part of teaching was assigning. I hated it. And so I just get yeah. to go in and have the fun. Right. <laughs> How about uh, view agriculture education K through 12? Is it, what's the, in the 21st century being new? There's a lot, just a comment on that. Well... That concerns me, Katie. Uh, I can see myself. Um, I'm constantly updating myself technologically. Oh, yeah. uh, our combine has more computer capabilities in it than were invented 10 years ago. Uh, I just bought a new tractor with uh, uh, tremendous amounts of electronics in it. Um, college is important. Somebody has to be developing these things, uh, but there also needs to be people who... Uh, are using them and know how to use them in the field. Uh, the same thing is true with the genetics of uh, how uh, the crop genetics are changing. Uh, the ideas on precision application of nutrients to protect the environment and to make sure we get the max maximum use of out of our nutrients is something that uh, in the last 10 years has just exploded. So uh, back to the K through 12, uh, I think we need to do everything we can to encourage our students to understand a little bit about the environment and the food production systems. Yeah. And uh, at that this, level, at that you, you can't start any younger. I started when I was gosh sakes, I can't remember. I, I I never remember not being outside, not being in the field. Right. Um, then uh, when one comes to college, we still we need college graduates who are capable of continuing on with the uh, basic research. But we also need college graduates who can bridge that to the producer. And that's why I was so uh, excited about the Certified Crop Advisory Program. So uh, the people who can make that bridge is where the biggest gap is going to be. And then we also need the individuals who uh, may be highly technically trained to be able to uh, understand the technology of uh, electronic technology and genetic technology. and. Uh, so as I look at that, these are the areas, as far as agriculture is concerned, where uh, we need to make sure that we have highly educated individuals. Who can meet the needs and the demands for that. Right, right. yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Jim, I want to thank you very much for this. It's been very nice. Thank oh, you Oh, well, thank much. you, Katie. Uh,